Hey everybody and welcome back to WCCF Tech TV. This is Keith once again and today we've gone through the hassle of upgrading our workstation slash test bench from our Z87 and Core i7 4770K to an Asus X99A-2 motherboard and a new Broadwell E 6800K. Now for the purpose of this video what we wanted to do is talk about the overclocking performance uh, how well it overclocked, if it overclocked very well, or how poorly it overclocked, as well as the results of the overclock. Now, starting off with, like I said, we had the ASUS X99A-2 motherboard with the full Broadwell E support. The 6800K, we went for that one because most of the tests we're doing, actually all of them at this point, have been with single GPU, so PCI Express lanes aren't exactly a concern for us at the moment. But we did go ahead and throw in 32 gigs of RAM because, well, it's also what we use for editing. So I figured why not take advantage of that. So now before we get into the benchmarks, let's talk about the overclock itself. Now we did a baseline run for all of the tests at stock frequencies, which is a 3.4 base 3.6 turbo. Now when we got into overclocking, we went up to uh, 4.2 at 1.22 volts and then that what we consider that kind of the middle of the road then we kind of pushed it as far as we could and the farthest we could really get it comfortably and when I say comfortably I mean it was I wasn't really comfortable with these temperatures and everything that we were getting but 4.4 gigahertz at 1.4 volts now a quick look around online saw that this was fairly common for this chip so evidently the 6800k is just not exactly the greatest clocker in the world even the highest clock one reported on hwbot is 4.6 at 1.45 volts which that was on custom water whereas we're using a silverstone tdo2 light all in one now the system that we're running again is the i7 6800k the asus x99a-2 motherboard with a cooler master v1200 platinum power supply a crucial mx 100 512 gig ssd and a Seagate to uh, 4 terabyte SSHD with a Corsair Vengeance LPX 32 gigabytes of DDR4 2400 megahertz RAM and using the EVGA GTX 980 Ti and running Windows 10 64 bit build 10586. Now, as we jump into the benchmarks, the first one we looked at was HWBot X265 encoding. Now, this is just an X265 encoding performance, and we ran it 1080p with a high priority. And stock did pretty good with 24.12 FPS, 4.2 yielded 27.3, and 28 FPS for 4.4. Now moving past that benchmark, we jumped into Cinebench R15. On multi, we get 1140 at stock, 4.2 got us 1229, and 4.4 yielded 1343. Now moving that to the single core performance, uh, that's 146 at stock, 172 at 4.2, and then 175 at 4.4. Not a lot of gains there at 4.4 to be honest. Now uh, Firestrike Physics, we ran the entire benchmark suite to get the physics score instead of just doing the individual physics. It's just the way I felt like doing that to be quite honest. Um, at stock speeds, we got a physics score of 16,105. 4.2 yielded 18,683, whereas 4.4 gigahertz got us 19,621. Moving on to Geekbench, uh, running the 32-bit version, and this test tests uh, integer performance. Uh, single core at stock, we got 3418, 4.2 got us 3902, and 4.4 got us 4077. Now, when we moved up to multi-core, we got 20,439 at stock, 23,340 at 4.2, and 24,093 at 4.4. Now, the last test that we ran was Intel's XTU, or the Extreme Tuning Utility. We used the built-in benchmark to get a score, and at stock, we yielded 1540. Once overclocked to 4.2, we got 1710. And then pushed all the way up to 4.4, we got 1756, which you, you see a pattern here going from stock to 4.2 is pretty good, 4.2 to 4.4. Mm. Well, the last thing that we looked at here were power draw temps. Now, as far as power draw goes, the 6800K at stock idled at 87 watts and under full load pulled 178. And 
at 4.2, 118 watts idle, so significantly higher once you overclock it. Now, load it went up to 231 watts. Um, and then pushing it on up to 4.4, you'll just 130 watts at idle with 270 under full load. Now, for these power draw and the temps, we were taking these readings at the peak point throughout the XTU benchmark. Now, temperature-wise, uh, stock idled at 29 with a load of 47. 4.2 idled at 30 with a load of 64 and then the 6 at 4.4 gigahertz we idled it a little bit warmer at 32 with a maximum temperatures of 79 which is much higher than I really wanted to see now in the end the overclocking performance was kind of um, unfortunate I guess would be the best way that I could say it. I mean, 3.3 base to 4.4 full gigahertz overclock is okay. It's not exactly what we're used to seeing in the past with Haswell E overclocking fairly well. Um, and like I said, a quick look around online found other people getting pretty close similar overclocks. Even like I said before, HW bought the highest one I found on there was 4.6. So. Uh, stock to 4.2, really good improvements, fairly easy to keep the temperatures under control. 4.2 to 4.4, uh, too much voltage, too much heat, not enough of a turnaround in my opinion. So 4.2 seems to be a good sweet spot overclock for this chip. Now, maybe future BIOS revisions will allow for a higher clock, I don't know, but I'll test that in the future and if it changes, I'll let you guys know. That's been it for today, and if you found any of this interesting or informative, feel free to subscribe and like and leave a comment of what you'd like to see in the future. And this has been Keith with WCCF Tech TV, and we'll catch you all in the next one.